Hey guys, it's KJ with Living Christian. Welcome to the latest episode of the Bible Reading and Coffee Drinking Podcast. If this is your first time joining me, what we do here is pretty simple. I read a chapter of the Bible, drink a little bit of coffee, and talk a whole lot about Jesus. We read a chapter of the Bible, discuss it along the way, and afterwards I'll be answering a few questions. If you want to watch this live, being recorded live, we do it every Monday and Friday on Instagram Live. Look me up over there. It's just living underscore Christian. Uh, and you can join in as we record this every Monday and Friday. So if you miss any of these episodes, you can watch them on YouTube. Listen to them everywhere that you have podcasts. I appreciate you sharing this with a friend. Maybe they need to watch or listen to it. It'd be great. Also, maybe drop a rating or review. Whether you're listening to it on Apple or Spotify or wherever, or you're watching it on YouTube, it helps me get the word out. If you share that, rate it and review it. I appreciate it. Make sure you check out uh, livingchristian.org, which is my website. There we have Bible verse lists, blogs, a whole apparel store. Uh, has all sorts of coffee mugs and t-shirts and hoodies and all sorts of good stuff. Make sure you use the code PODCAST20 while you're there, and that'll give you 20% off your entire order every single time, exclusive for my podcast listeners. So I uh, appreciate you joining me. I hope you love it. I hope you get something out of it. Uh, join me on Mondays and Fridays if you'd like to on Instagram. Till then, let's check out the newest episode. All right, welcome to another episode of the Bible Reading and Coffee Drinking Podcast. We are in Daniel 6 today, so get your Bibles if you want to read along. If you want to just listen to me, listen to me. Daniel 6 is Daniel in the lion's den. So just to set the tone here a little bit, uh, in, in, in this uh, chapter of, the, of Daniel, he is about to get thrown into the lion's den for a variety of reasons. We're going to talk about it as we read Daniel 6. This is a great story about uh, sticking with your faith and, and uh, being rewarded for that faith and trusting in God the entire time. So let's get started with Daniel 6, and I'll answer a little bit of uh, a few questions at the end here. So Daniel chapter 6, Daniel and the lion's den. Darius the Mede decided to divide the kingdom into 120 provinces, and he appointed a high officer to rule each province. The king also chose Daniel and two, other, two others as administrators to supervise the high officers and protect the the king's interest. Daniel soon proved himself more capable than all the other administrators and high officers. Because of Daniel's great ability, the king made plans to place him over the entire empire. So there was a little bit of trust going on, regardless of uh, Daniel's uh, faith, which we're going to get into in a minute. So at the beginning, Darius has a lot of trust in Daniel. Then the other administrators and high officers began searching for some fault in the way Daniel was handling government affairs, but they couldn't find anything to criticize or condemn. He was faithful, always responsible, and completely trustworthy. So they concluded our only chance of finding grounds for accusing Daniel will be connection with the rules of his religion. So now they're turning on his faith, right? So uh, the king trusts him. The other guys are getting jealous, and they're looking for a way to get Daniel into trouble. Uh, verse 6. So the administrators and high officers went to the king and said, Long live King Darius. We are all in agreement, we administrators, officials, high officers, advisors, and governors, that the king should make a law that would be strictly enforced. Give orders that for the next 30 days, any person who prays to anyone, divine or human, except to you, your majesty, will be thrown into the den of the lions. And now your majesty issue and sign this law so it cannot be changed, an official law of the Medes and Persians that cannot be revoked. So King Darius sign the law. So they tricked him, right? He, they played to his ego. Uh, you know, they 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 wanted to catch Daniel uh, because he was kind of the star pupil, so to speak. He was really the one that the king trusted the most, okay? Uh, and the other administrators and people were getting jealous of him, so they tried to catch him, so they kind of tricked the, the king into creating this new law uh, that played to his ego, uh, and that's a whole other lesson in its own right about trying to keep your ego in check. So the King Darius did not do that. Uh, so he signed a law and created a law that said nobody can pray for 30 days. Only people can pray to him, which obviously is not going to do anything. Uh, verse 10. But when Daniel learned that the law had been signed, this is important here, he went home and knelt down as usual in the upstairs room with its windows open towards Jerusalem. He prayed three times a day, just as he had always done, giving thanks to his God. Then the officials went together to Daniel's house and found him praying and asked for God, asking for God's help. So they went straight to the king and reminded him of the law. Did, did you not sign a law that for the next 30 days, any person who prays to anyone divine or human, <coughs> excuse me, except to you, your majesty, will be thrown into the lions, the den of lions? Yes, the king replied. 
That decision stands as official law of the Medes and Persians that cannot be revoked. So they knew that Daniel was going to fall on his knees and pray because Daniel was faithful. And when Daniel realized, a lesson that we can learn here uh, with Daniel, uh, even at this part of the story, is no matter what uh, society, the government, or other people tell you to do, if, they, if they're trying to suppress your faith and distance you from God, don't let them. Because that's what this is the lesson that our entire society is trying to do right now, which is distance itself, distance us from Jesus and from God. If you think about all the things we watch, all the things we hear, our society in general, it's pulling us and distracting us, but pulling us away from God. And that's what this, they were trying to do with Daniel, <clears throat> which is pull him away from God and kind of make that distinct, like you need to worship and pray to people and to the king, and you know you need to love the creation and not the creator, so to speak. Uh, so that is something that we still deal with every single day in our lives, being pulled away in the society that we live in, wanting us to worship it and not God and not Jesus. So that's something that we need to take note of every single day in our lives, uh, of what is trying to pull us away from Jesus, what is trying to replace Jesus in our heart. All right. So the king and the government at that time was trying to replace God in society. He wanted, he wanted to be worshipped. So he did this law. All right, let's go on to verse 13. Have a sip of coffee first. Then they told the king, that man Daniel, I love how they call it that man Daniel. Like he doesn't know who Daniel is. That man Daniel, one of the captives from Judah, is ignoring you and your law. He still prays to his God three times a day. How many times a day? Three times a day. Why three times a day? Jesus raised on what day? The third day. Lots of symbolism on numbers throughout the Bible. 3, 7, 40. Make sure when you're reading these stories, you kind of take note of all, all, all the crossovers. Because it, there's a reason why he prayed three times a day. There's a reason why Jesus was raised on the third day. It's all correlated. It all comes back to Christ. It all kind of foretells uh, the story of Jesus Christ, this entire Bible. Even though this is in the Old Testament. It's pretty cool. All right. Sorry to get back. That was tangent. All right, verse 14. Hearing this, the king was deeply troubled, and he tried to think of a way to save Daniel. He spent the rest of the day looking for a way to get Daniel out of his predicament. In the evening, the men went together into the king and said, Your majesty, you know that according to the law of Medes and Persians, no law that the king signs can be changed. So at last, the king gave orders for Daniel to be arrested and thrown into the den of the lions. The king said to him, May your God, whom you serve so faithfully, rescue you. He's kind of mocking God there for a second, mocking Daniel, which obviously is never a good thing, right? So he's like, okay, I, I, I have to do this. You know, let your God save you if, if, he, if he is real. Verse 17, a stone was brought and placed over the mouth of the den. The king sealed the stone with his own royal seal and the seals of his nobles so that no one could rescue Daniel. Then the king returned to the palace and spent the night fasting. He refused his usual entertainment couldn't sleep at all that night. Why do you think the king couldn't sleep that night? He was troubled by what he did. He liked Daniel. But he made he got tricked into making the law, so to speak. But he made the law, and he stood by the law. Because he viewed himself as above God. And he knew this, so it troubled him a little bit. Because he didn't want to do it, but he did. A little bit of foreshadowing. Uh, if you read the New Testament and the... And the um, and the whole story about um, the crucifixion and, and kind of Pontius Pilate begrudgingly, you know, um, convicting Jesus. He, he sent him away, right? And then they brought him back. He didn't want to do it. He wanted it to be the law, you know, the religious leaders that you're breaking your laws. or He's not breaking my laws. He didn't want necessarily to, um, to crucify Jesus, but he did. So it's a little bit of a correlation a lot of symbolism and correlation in these stories. This king, right, didn't want to throw Daniel in the lion's den, but he, he ended up having to do it. Verse 19, very early the next morning, the king got up and hurried out to the lion's den. When he got there, <clears throat> he called out in anguish, Daniel, the servant of the living God, was your God, whom you serve so faithfully, able to rescue you for the lions? Daniel answered, long live the king. 
Who do you think Daniel is referring to? You think he's referring to this king? Absolutely not. Jesus Christ. Daniel said, long live the king. My God sent his angel to shut the lion's mouth so that they would not hurt me. For I have been found innocent in his sight, and I have not wronged you, your majesty. The king was overjoyed and ordered that Daniel be lifted from the den. Not a scratch was found on him, for he had trusted in his God. So, everybody knows the lesson of this one. This is the easy one. Trust God. Even in the worst circumstances, you got to trust God to get, it through, to get you through it. I don't know what you're dealing with right now. I don't know what hardships you're dealing with, uh, what suffering you may be dealing with in your personal life. The, our world is, is, a, is a hot mess. Uh, we're all dealing with that. Uh, but we all are having predicaments in our life that are challenging. Now, we're not in a den of lions challenging. We may act like we are sometimes, but we're not. So if Daniel can survive with lions that want to eat him, if God can protect him, from that, he, he can help you out and protect you from whatever challenges you're dealing with, whatever um, issues you're dealing with, or things that are challenging you or going against you right now. God is stronger. I promise you that. All right, verse um, 24. Then the king gave orders to arrest the men who had maliciously accused Daniel. He had them thrown into the lion's den along with their wives and children. Holy mackerel, that's harsh. The lions leapt on them and tore them apart before they even hit the floor of the den. So he took the people that were uh, against God and against Daniel, threw them in the den. Before they had hit the floor, the lions had taken care of all of them. The men, the women, and their children, which is harsh beyond belief, but God is fair. God is just. Then King Darius sent this message to the people of every race and nation and language throughout the world. Not just his world, the entire world, which is hard to believe at this time. Peace and prosperity to you. I decree that everyone throughout my kingdom should tremble with fear before the God of Daniel. For he is a living God, and he will endure forever. His kingdom will never be destroyed, and his rule will never end. His rescue, he rescues and saves his people. He performs miraculous signs and wonders in the heavens and on earth. He has rescued Daniel from the power of the lions. Verse 28. So Daniel prospered during the reign of Darius and the reign of Cyrus the Persian. So a couple things happened here. All right. Other than the, the foretelling uh, of, of, of the story of Jesus, other than that, which is a huge part of Daniel 6, and most of Daniel, quite frankly, a couple things that were learned. One is Daniel never lost faith in God. He didn't deviate. He didn't waver. Even when there was a law against him, he went and prayed with the window open to make sure everybody heard it three times. Second lesson. You go against God and you blaspheme God. It's not going to work out well for you. Not to, not to be all fire and brimstone on you, but these guys who went against God and, and, and make sure Daniel was punished and tried to get him out of the way so they could focus on the government and the society and the work and the king, they were severely punished. Not only them, but their entire family was punished for those sins. The third lesson is the king himself, King Darius. Reluctant. Right? He liked Daniel. He trusted Daniel. He understood Daniel's faith. Did he believe in, in God? I think he was shown what God can do. And at the end, he proclaims it. Right, He proclaims because he was able to see the miracle in his own sight and changed his perspective. So no matter where you are, if you've strayed away, right? if you've strayed away, from God. If you're kind of lukewarm on God, or you kind of think about it, it's, oh, that's Daniel's God. But I, I think he, it may be right, but it's not for me. You can change your heart. So if you have a friend or family member that is <clears throat> straying away, or doesn't know the, the story of Jesus Christ, or kind of respects your faith, but doesn't want to join in because of for whatever circumstance, now is the time to bring them in. 
You want your friends and family members and everybody you know and everybody you run into to turn in more into like the king where they have a change of heart and proclaim that he is the living God and he will endure forever. That They're the words of the king. You want them to proclaim that. You don't want them to be the men and his their families who go against God and get thrown into the lion's den because God did not protect them. So where are you in your life? Where are your family members? We don't know what's going to happen next. We don't know how long we have on this planet. We don't know whether Jesus is coming back today or a year from today or a hundred years from today. You should always be ready. And with that being ready, where are you in your life cycle? And where are you with your relationship with, with Christ? Are you a Daniel? Are you a King Darius? Or are you the other administrators? You definitely don't want to be in that group. <laughs> right? Amen to that. And if you're in the King Darius world where you're trying to be too much in this world and you're trying to control things and not giving them over to, to God the way Daniel did, think through, maybe read this book again, read this chapter again, and think about where you're at with your relationship with God. Let's all try to be a Daniel today, okay? All right, hope you guys like Daniel 6. Great story. I mean, it's a it's it's the age-old one, right? I mean, I, we, we all learned it in Sunday school. <laughs> it's one of the uh, you know top five stories that they teach you in Sunday school between uh, Noah and the ark and, you know, Moses and there's all, all sorts of ones that they teach you and uh, from the beginning when it gets you young. And uh, Daniel's certainly one of them. And for good reason. It's a fantastic uh, book, the whole book, but much less that chapter. All right, let's uh, take a couple of questions here and then uh, we'll go about our weekend. I can't believe it's Friday already. I'm ready for the weekend. It's supposed to be um, lovely weather here in Texas. So I'm going to try to get out and do some some stuff outside and be nice. Um, it'll be uh, nice and warm, I think, which is, uh, I'm ready for springtime. So, all right, let's take a couple questions. Um, if you're live on Instagram, make sure you, uh, you know, ask a question there on the bottom, and I'll be answering uh, a few of them. All right, we got a few of them here already, so if you uh, have a question, ask in there. I'll try to answer three or four today. All right, uh, with Easter coming soon, how can we best prepare for this as Christians? Okay, that's a great question. There's a lot of ways to prepare for Easter. So Easter's coming up. Uh, this past Wednesday was Ash Wednesday. It's the beginning of Lent. So you got 40 days until Easter, not counting Sundays. Uh, so 40, whatever, I don't know how many days we are now on the 24th. Sorry, I don't have a calendar in front of me, but we're roughly, uh, you know, 43 days or so uh, from Easter. Uh, so the question is, how do you prepare yourself for Easter uh, in another month and a half or so? Okay. So there's a couple things you can do. <clears throat> Traditionally, from a religious standpoint, Ash Wednesday was Wednesday. Uh, you can start a 40-day cycle of Lent uh, and, and give up something, sacrifice something. Uh, if that, uh, if you're so desired to do that, uh, not everybody does that. A lot of uh, Catholics, uh, Lutherans, etc., a lot of different denominations certainly do that. I'm a non-denominational person. Uh, we do not necessarily do Ash Wednesday. Not against it. Just not not something that we do, <laughs> but um, so sometimes we do kind of observe Lent. I think it's a good sacrifice and a good way uh, to prepare yourself for the sacrifice that Jesus did and uh, and uh, on Easter, on Resurrection Sunday and Good Friday. So, uh, so one way is to give something up, uh, whether you want to intermittent fast or fully fast and buy food or some sort of fasting, or, or if you just want to Give something up in terms of getting off social media for, you know, 40 days or whatever that may be. That's a good way to kind of prepare yourself. That sacrifice to prepare yourself uh, for uh, for Easter and, um, and Good Friday and Resurrection Sunday. So there's a lot of ways to do it. Uh, I'm doing intermittent fasting right now, so I'm not eating anything until lunchtime. So uh, I go from dinner to lunch without eating. Uh, it's getting It's getting easier. Uh, but that's not much fun, but you can do it. Uh, the Daniel fast is kind of cool. I've done that a few times. Uh, speaking of the book of Daniel, uh, that is uh, uh, very fun to do. Uh, that's You're only eating things that would be available to Daniel. It's kind of tricky. You can look it up online, but uh, that's not too bad. Uh, I've done that a few times, actually. Uh, the other way I would say, other than the, 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 the Lent and the sacrificing part of preparing yourself for Easter, is read your Bible. Get ready and read... Uh, some you know, read some of the books of the gospel to learn about Jesus and prepare yourself uh, for Easter. There's a lot of good Easter um, Bible plans out there. If you have U version or some of the other Bible apps, uh, there's a lot of Easter ones uh, that you can do. So try that, uh, which is great. But either way, dive into Scripture and and really read about the life of Jesus as we all get ready to prepare 
his crucifixion, prepare for his crucifixion, and obviously the Resurrection Sunday, which is Easter, which is what we all want to celebrate. All right. So, so try to, that was a couple of ways. So try to do Lent, try to do uh, some, something where you sacrifice, but more importantly, dive into the Bible, read about Jesus and get ready for uh, Easter, which is always fun. All right. Uh, a couple other questions here. Oh, we got, uh, got some more coming on here. Um, I would love to hear your thoughts on Asbury uh, and the revival in general. Okay. I'll give you my thoughts. I, I know a little bit about it. Um, so for those who don't know, in North Carolina, there's a university, Asbury, North Carolina. They, they did a um, revival of sorts. They did a, a worship service that lasted forever, right? A lot, many, many, many days. They've done this in the past, many years ago. I don't know when the last one was, but like 1970 or something. But they've done it before in the past. So if organically, it seems like it's a fantastic uh, thing. And, and, and the Holy Spirit is working on that campus. Now, if you look... I live in Texas, so it, it, now that has kind of spread to Baylor University, Texas A&M. There's a lot of revivals uh, that are going on. There are these people just worshiping and praying and, and uh, accepting Christ as their Savior. So on, on that, I think it's a wonderful, wonderful thing. I have a few friends of mine that actually went. We had some people from our church actually go as well. Uh, and they all found it being very authentic and uh, and a, a really kind of touching, um, um, touching event. Uh, so everybody that I know that has gone there uh, over the last couple of weeks uh, has been uh, touched and really just felt it was awesome and authentic and a fantastic thing. So I think sometimes God shows us uh, there's a lot of ugliness in this world right now. Uh, we've got wars uh, going on. We've got Ukraine. We've had COVID the last few years. And sometimes God steps in and, and reminds us who he is by events such as this, this revival, uh, and just showing that it appears on the news and appears different places, and showing people being moved by the Holy Spirit. So there, I think there are times that God has to kind of step down and go, let me remind you who's in charge here, okay? You can get distracted by this world, but you want to come worship me, and you want to live with the Holy Spirit, here's an opportunity to get to know that a little bit. So I think it's a fantastic thing. So that's my uh, that's my opinion. I didn't get to go, so I'd probably have more to talk about if I, uh, if I didn't, so... Um, let's, uh, let's see what other questions we have. We have time for maybe two more. Um, let's see what we got here. Got a lot here, so I'm sorry if I don't get yours. There's a lot. Uh, um, is it going to be disrespectful for the Lord if you work during Easter? Um, I, I think, you know, that's, the, I'm probably going to get some comments on this, but there are a lot of people that come back with the Sabbath and, and the seventh day, and, and if it's that Sunday, is it Saturday, Easter's a day. Um, I, I don't think anywhere in the Bible that it says that you can't work on Resurrection Sunday, so to speak. Um, I, I personally uh, do not. I, I don't know about it disrespectful. I'll, you'll have to ask God that one day. Uh, but I try to not do much on Good Friday and not do much on Easter Sunday in terms of work. Uh, I try to focus uh, on on the event itself. So uh, Good Friday, I, I typically relax, read, you know, not not go to my day job, so to speak. Uh, even on on Sunday, I try to be with our church and uh, spend time with the church and go to the service and do all the things and just try to just be saturated with the Holy Spirit. Just try to take the moment in. And we should probably do that every week, to be honest with you. I, just because Easter comes around doesn't necessarily mean that, uh, you know, we, we, we give it more on Easter than we do on, uh, uh, on any other Sunday or any other day of the week. Uh, we should be, uh, you know, following Jesus and, and, and worshiping him every single day of the week, every single day of the year, uh, not just on Easter. But Easter is a special day. So uh, if you can take off, uh, I don't know if it's disrespectful. I'd pray about it and talk to him about it and uh, work through it yourself. But um, I wouldn't overthink it too much. But don't, don't, if you have an opportunity, I wouldn't work. All right. Uh, let's see one more question, and then we'll get on out of here for the, uh, the weekend. Um, all right. Uh, will Jews go to heaven? I'll, I'll answer this one because uh, she, uh, she's always on here and she's a friend of mine. Will Jews go to heaven since they don't believe in Jesus? That is a great question. Uh, it is a great question that um, I think my answer is this. I go back to the Bible. Period. Jesus' own words were, 
The only way to the Father is through him. Period. If you read and believe the Bible, Jesus is the only way. Now, saying that, anybody who doesn't believe that, the path is narrow, as Jesus said. All right? Many will not make it. The path to hell, so to speak, is wide. Now, saying all that, let's forget for a moment that what the classification of people are. Okay? There are many people, many Jews. I frankly, we have uh, you know a a, a a a man in our church that's one of our church leaders that was raised Jewish forever, and he converted and is now a pastor at our church, which is fantastic. Jesus is the only way, but I don't know what's in everybody's hearts. Okay, so let's put the classifications aside for a second and just talk through this. People need to accept Christ as um, the Messiah, as God as fully God, fully man, right? They need to accept that. Now, I don't know what people have in their hearts, so I'm not going to say yes or no in terms of like a, a, some generalization. What I'm going to say is they need to accept Christ as their Savior. If you do that, and you believe in it, and you follow Christ, you go to heaven. It's as simple as that. Not always easy, but it's as simple as that. So, whether it's a non-believer or a Jewish person or anybody else that is, uh, you know, believes a different way, um, we need to talk to them and get them to understand uh, that Jesus is the way for sure. Okay, He is the way. Jesus is King. If you read the entire Bible, the whole thing, the Old Testament, New Testament, is all about Jesus. We just proved that in Daniel six that we read. We just proved with the, all the foreshadowing and the correlations between that story and Jesus. We just proved that. So if you read the Gospels, right, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and even kind of going into Paul's writings with Acts, which was written by Luke, but once you get past into that, all the letters and, and um, the from Paul, and you read the, the New Testament and then go back and read the Old Testament, you understand that the entire Old Testament is about Jesus. In the beginning, Genesis 1. They even talked about, and we've talked about this before, but they even talked about how the God said that man was made in their image. Whose image? Father, Son, Holy Spirit. He was there at the beginning. First John 1. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. Jesus was there from the beginning. This whole thing is about Jesus Christ. So, saying all that, if you have somebody in your life that doesn't understand that or believe that, Regardless of whether if they're associated with another religion or they're, you know, they don't, they just have, haven't been exposed to it, don't be afraid to talk to them about Jesus. Period. It's about the relationship with Christ. It's not necessarily about the classifications or the religions or the denominations. I don't care whether you're Methodist, Baptist, Catholic, Lutheran, Jewish. I don't. I, I, do you believe in Christ? The rest of it is kind of our own interpretations and our own ways of making sense of it all. The relationship is what we have to work on. Okay? All right. That's my answer. Hopefully that's okay. <laughs> Hopefully that's okay. Anyways, uh, let's take a quick, uh, do a quick prayer, and then we'll get about our weekend. Uh, and let's uh, let's pray for people who don't know Jesus yet. Heavenly Father, we come to you today. Thanking you first and foremost for allowing us to get together. Allowing us to read Daniel 6. Allowing us to understand that in many ways... We are Daniel, and sometimes we are the king, and sometimes we're the administrators. Help us be strong enough to have the faith of Daniel, to have the faith to pray when people tell us not to, to have the faith to be able to be willing to jump in the lion's den knowing that you're going to save us. And how many lives and souls were changed because of Daniel's faith? Give us the strength and the guidance to just, just be like that a little bit, Lord. I'm praying for everybody watching this or listening to this to be that way. There's so many people in our world, there's so many people in our lives, Lord, that don't know you, that don't know Jesus. I'm praying for them right now. I'm praying that they stop chasing whatever it is that they think they need and start chasing Jesus. So many people in this world, in our lives, and in our families, and in our friends, have a hole inside of them that they don't know how to fill, Lord. 
They're filling it with all sorts of things in this world. And what they need to fill it with is you. They just don't know it yet. So I'm praying today, Lord, use us as vessels to be change agents in their lives, to introduce them and to be brave enough to introduce them to Jesus. I'm praying for that strength and that guidance today for not only me, but for everybody watching or listening to this. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, guys. Hopefully you guys have a great weekend. Um, Read your Bible. Get ready for Easter here in a a few weeks, as we talked about. And uh, and we'll do it all again on Monday. Until next time, keep Jesus on your heart and forever on your mind. Love you guys. Talk to you all soon.